up? What's up, everybody? Patrick Campbell here. And just a quick note before we jump in, just to really lower expectations here, because I know some of you have no idea who, who I am. Some of you do. Um, I'm really embarrassed by the fact that I'm in a hotel room recording this. I had recorded it in a nice, like, fancy studio at my house, um, and we're really well known for, like, our production value. Um, and then I didn't even bring my, my traveling podcast studio. I decided to just bring my headphones to this conference I'm in. So um, I'm a little insecure about it, but that's okay. That's okay. I just wanted to point out the irony of a guy sitting in his hotel room recording this um, from Dublin um, rather than using this fancy stuff when we're going to talk about some fancy stuff that we do. So with that out of the way, as long as we're all okay and we all can handle the, uh, the irony, um, let me jump in a little bit. And um, I think the, the big thing that I want to focus on is, is really what we're talking about today, which is this whole concept of inbound media. And um, for those that don't know, um, ProfitWell was the company that I founded. Um, we recently got bought. I'll talk about that in a second. But basically, um, when we were trying to figure out marketing, when I say we, it was me. I, as the CEO, basically owned marketing um, and essentially was like, what should we do, right? And in studying the data that I'm going to share with you today, we basically decided like, hey, let's go, let's 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 change the way that we do this kind of concept of inbound marketing um, and let's make it you know, more media-based where we can kind of do shows and we can kind of do episodic type content rather than like, you know, ebook type content. And really it was like an and, it wasn't an or, but um, we were one of the first, if, I, I think we were the first B2B company to do this um, because you started seeing this a little bit in consumer brands, and obviously in media brands, but we were the first B2B one and we're bootstrapped too. Um, so we had never raised any funding. Um, I gained a hundred pounds. So that was kind of like my, you know, my, my tax on building the business. Um, but yeah, so it was one of those things where um, it's it's a truly unique kind of thing where this look is looked at as like an expensive thing, you know, inbound media, but we as a bootstrap company chose to do it. And we're going to walk through that because I believe in this particular market right now um, and in the market that's going to continue, this is the method. If there's a brand or content play um, for your industry, which some industries they're not, um, it doesn't really matter who you are, or what type of business you're in. If there is a brand play, this is the brand play to go after because it's so much more than just like this nebulous concept of a brand. So we're going to unpack this. And the reason I think this is so crucial, I just kind of reference the market is because you might think everything's amazing. You might think that like you're going to crush it. You're like the one marketer in the world who somehow has a supportive, you know, C-suite um, and is not being blamed for everything, right? Like I know I'm being hyperbolic, but normally you are blamed for a lot of things, but the problem is, is that all markets, it does not matter your vertical, does not matter your delivery mechanism, are you a media company, a consumer company, a tech company, does, does not retail, does not matter what you're doing. Every single market out there is increasing in difficulty um, and density. And the reason for this, and we have a ton of data that we're able to study just given the nature of what we do, which I'll explain in a second. But to give you a little bit of context, if you started a business today, you would have 16 times the number of competitors than you did 10 years ago. And this is because you, every single one of us um, can basically go out, we could spin up a server, we could spin up a website, start driving traffic to that website by the end of the day today, right? Um, it's not like 15, 20 years ago where like the hardest thing was like getting the thing accessible from the internet, whether it was like a sales page or whether it was, you know, content or whatever it is. Now, because of all of those logos that exist now, all of those web pages that are coming online and the fact that we've gone from a brand new or innovated marketing channel every single quarter to basically one every five years. Um, we had Snapchat, now we have TikTok, but that was five years between those two. Um, basically now CAC, customer acquisition costs, and we see this across the board, consumers, e-commerce, retail, like everything, um, CAC is up about 130%. And you might be sitting there, you might be like, oh, I'm really sneaky. I've got a really, really good industry, a really, really good vertical. Well, your team, they're not sticking around as long as they were. So this over the past five years, a team tenure is basically down by a third. Um, and you're like, okay, cool. But like, we pay them more. Well, you are paying them more, but it's not affecting the tenure. So things are more expensive um, in multiple different places. Um, it's just getting harder. It's really, really dense. And the reason I bring this up is because this means that tactical excellence is now just like the entry for a chance at rapid growth. And when I think about our journey as a bootstrapped, resource-constrained company, going from nothing, me in a room working 18 hours a day, to a, you know, you know, over $200 million exit, you know, nine years later, um, don't worry, I still dress like this. Uh, so nothing, nothing has changed, even though I got some cash now. But when I think about that, the thing we got right, and I don't know if we did it at the time, and obviously it was right in hindsight, is we were very, very methodical about where we chose our marketing spots. And one of those spots was inbound media, which we'll talk about today. Um, but I wanna uncover the data that led to that, what we've done, 
why I think this is so important. Um, and then there hopefully will, will be the Q&A um, after this recording <coughs> that we can go through. Sound good? Cool? Everybody fired up? You fired up? All right, let's jump in. So who the heck am I? I've kind of given a little bit of background, Patrick Campbell. Um, so my background is in econometrics and math, um, which is code for having a lot of friends as a child. Um, yeah, mostly spreadsheets. But uh, started my career working in U.S. intelligence in D.C., then worked at Google, uh, and then started this company called ProfitWell. And, and ProfitWell, with now a com combination with this company called Paddle, our joint mission is basically to run and grow subscription companies automatically. Um, and we were the grow part. Paddle was the run part. And so we just kind of smushed those together with this acquisition or this merger. And at ProfitWell, the way I have all this data and some of the data that you'll see in, in deeper in the deck is, we basically have 20%, it's probably about 25% of the entire subscription market um, from e-commerce products to media products to B2B SaaS products, all of them um, using our free profitable metrics tool uh, where you can plug in your billing system, Stripe, Chargebee, Paddle, Zora, whatever you're using and get free access to all of your financial metrics in a really, really accurate way. And then we study that data and optimize. And the way we make money is we optimize your pricing, your churn. Um, as well as optimize your tax, your currencies, all these different things. Um, and so it's, it's a it was a really good partnership kind of made in heaven here. But I give you that context not to sell you, but just give you a little little context on like where a lot of this data comes from, but also where some of the constraints were. Um, so with that said, like, let's jump in. And I think the, the place to kind of start, um, there's a little bit of like a pet, like a pet, uh, you know, topic that I'm going to start with, and then we're going to get deep into the amount media. But I think they follow each other because when we started, um, my response to marketing was I'd worked at Google. So I was like, well, marketing is just ads. Like I had no idea that marketing was like more than just ads, um, which I know sounds really dumb, but like, I didn't even know what SEO was and I worked at Google. And so I think what was really kind of interesting is we had a free HubSpot account um, in the early days. And so I was like, well, I can write. So let me like start writing blog posts. So that's kind of where we started, right? I was just writing. And when I say we, it was just me. Um, but you know, I was basically writing, you know, one blog post a week, then kind of trying to increase it to two blog posts a week. But the one thing that kind of unlocked this, which is something that you've all heard before, is this beautiful concept of buyer personas. Um, and I know, again, I know you've heard it before, but the thing that really helped me at that time was actually listening to one of those Startups 101 classes that I ended up taking and really realizing that like everything in your business, from your sales and your marketing, all the way down to your product team and your finance team, is used to drive someone to a point of conversion or to justify the product or the price that you're offering them. And the really important part here, this is a person, this is a human being, this is an individual. Now we segment them, we group them, we personify them. We do a bunch of different things because that just makes sense tactically, right? Because ultimately what ends up happening is, you know, you're not, you know, there are some things you can do to block and tackle on an actual single person, but overall you're marketing to, to segments and groups. But the reason that that was so crucial that we're going after a person is because I think that a lot of times, one, we, we just kind of spray and pray a lot of what we're doing. But when it comes to content, we end up not like surgically realizing that like this person needs to be entertained. This person needs to be educated. This person, you know, has like 2.2 kids and, you know, just can't wait to get the Toyota Sienna minivan. Like we need to understand at that level not only because it helps us kind of define our pricing and our products and all these other things, but this was like one of the first steps to, to kind of realizing the, the, the vision of audience or the vision of inbound media. Um, and I'll return to that in just a second, but the, the thing I want to kind of give you and like really harp on here for a second from a buyer persona's perspective is um, we looked at about, I think this was 6,000 different companies and we found that only one in five companies have personas of some kind. And I've been talking about this for 10 years. Like when I give talks, I'm always like, know your customer. Here's a bunch of research tactics to like find out who your customer is, all these other things. You've heard this. You've heard many talks. Maybe you've heard some of them from me. But like only one in five of us are doing it. And I think it's because we're lazy. Um, you know, it's okay. We're all lazy. I'm lazy. But I also think it's because like we just don't understand the impact that these personas really bring our business. So let me let me give you some data. And this data is from, you know, I think it's four to six thousand, depending on the graph I'm gonna show you. So first up, those folks who have personas, quantified personas, or ongoing customer research, they tend to grow at a 10 to 20 percent higher rate than those who have nothing. So nothing is not on this particular chart. The first one is just like some basic personas, like you understand on a basic level, you haven't collected any data, 
And then the other two bars are basically data or ongoing data, right? Give me some more information. CAC, 10 to 30% lower for folks who understand their customer. Obviously, if you understand where they go, which watering holes they go to for information or entertainment, you can advertise there. You can produce content that's very similar, right? And then final kind of kick in the face, um, NPS. NPS is much, much higher for those who have buyer personas or ongoing customer research. If you understand them, you can build better product for them. You can build better experiences for them, right? Everything is better, right? So I start here because I think that inbound media is like this shiny new thing, you know, that we've been doing for like five, six years, but like it, it's, a, it's a thing that's finally coming into vogue and it's coming into vogue because the market's harder. It's not coming into vogue because all of a sudden, like we figured everything else out. It's like, it's coming into vogue because the market's harder. And when the market's harder, if you understand who you're selling to, you understand your buyer personas, your segments, your ICPs, whatever the heck you want to call them, everything gets easier. Everything gets easier, including if this is the strategy for you. And so um, if you don't have these or you don't have a good framework, um, this is a template that I've created. Um, if you email me or find me on Twitter or whatever, I'm happy to send this to you. Um, and I recommend fill this out individually, like you and your team or you and your exec team or your co-founders, whatever matter your size is, review it as a team, like individually, like, hey, I thought this, you thought that, that type of a thing. And then debate something. And this is my bait and switch. This is basically me putting cheese on your broccoli and basically being like, okay, you're going to debate something because you're going to disagree. And all of a sudden, if you debate something, I almost guarantee you you're going to go, let's go talk to some people. Let's go get some data because that's that's the answer. It's like, let's settle the debate. Um, but I will say if the solution is just ego, like, no, I'm right, you're wrong, and we're just not going to do anything, find another team. I know that's hard right now in the market. Uh, it's probably not that hard in like the tech market, right? Um, depending on which market you're in for jobs and stuff like that. But like life is too short to work with people who don't want to win, especially in a marketing position. Marketing is so hard just politically inside an organization. You get blamed for everything. I think the average tenure is like less than two years. It's not because you guys are bad. It's just because like, it's hard. It's hard and you get blamed because it's like, well, sales didn't do anything wrong, right? Which is not always the case, right? Um, okay, that out of the way, let's get to the meat here. So profit law, what did we do? Basically what ended up happening, we were writing those blog posts once or twice a week. Um, started sending those out just to the list, right? Just, just really basic loop. And we had a couple of eBooks. We had one core eBook on pricing. And then I was like, we need a proper marketing team. Like the marketing team was me, right? And I was also a CEO and I was also helping with sales and also helping with all these other things, right? And we're a bootstrap company. So all of a sudden I'm like, I don't want to screw this up, right? It's not like I'm going to go find this like VP of marketing because we were terrible at hiring like senior talent, um, mainly because we weren't willing to pay as much as we should. Um, we've learned that lesson, thankfully, hopefully. Um, but it was one of those things where instead of like sitting back and going like, let's just copy and paste, um, we wanted to figure out like, where could we get the most leverage? And one of the first things that I noticed that kind of led me, you know, down this path was um, basically we started noticing that like a, the effectiveness of inbound marketing and like traditional like SEO, ebook, et cetera, it wasn't that it was bad, you know, because we have a very like aggressive SEO and, and ebook type of strategy. It's just like the effectiveness was going down, right? Like when you were writing an ebook eight years ago, um, even like a not great ebook, you were like a god. You were like, oh my god, they're giving away all this knowledge for free. Amazing, right? Like that was the reaction. In reality, though, um, that was going down because everyone's writing books, everyone's writing content, everyone's doing stuff. Some of the people are doing proper books, those types of things, right? So we started looking at this, and eventually, and I'll get to how we got here. Um, we basically at exit, um, which was in April, we had eight different podcast and video series, um, all about different parts of our business. Some were uh, problem focused, like pricing page teardown. Like people think of us like, oh, I need help with my pricing. Here's the show about pricing that had, you know, has like 60,000 people a month watching it. This like show on pricing. Um, we had protect the hustle, which is kind of like targeting a persona. It's like a generic SaaS operator um, type show. Uh, Trade-offs targeted the product persona. You know, we had eight different um, shows and podcasts. And the, the first step, was really understanding and mapping out like, what is demand gen? <laughs> like, what is the purpose of demand gen? And I think a lot of people don't spend the time to truly understand the first principles of what the heck is going on here. And I'm gonna explain, right? So we have this like spectrum, right? This continuum, if you will. And on one hand, we have like the point of conversion, right? And, and right before that, maybe an AE takes over, maybe it's a landing page if it's a self-serve motion, but 
And somewhere in there, it's it's shown to be an opportunity or a sales qualified lead or mark, like however you structure your phone, right? And along that particular continuum, you have like demo and audit requests, you have reading, you know, maybe they like download an ebook. Um, and then like, as you get higher up, you basically get like people who are a little bit further from you. So like GQ crowd, maybe they upvoted you on product hunt. Uh, and then there's like at the highest part, there's people who have thought of a solution or just care about the outcome, right? They don't know you exist, but they care about the outcome. And the whole point of everyone on this call is to move this river of leads as quickly as possible to this point of conversion, right? And this is where we have the funnel, right? We have the top of the funnel, the middle funnel, the bottom of the funnel, and there's always drop off in between. And I think that when you started looking at the data and I looked at a lot of data around like CAC, um, like breaking down CAC, a lot of data, like where do people push their budgets? Like where do most companies spend their budgets? And, and what you'll discover is all of the money goes to sales or closer to the top of the funnel. Now, of course there's stuff in the middle, but like it's a lot of outbound reps. It's a lot of like, advertising, a lot of paid ads. Um, it's a lot of events, those types of things, which are more like top of the funnel. And then you have like sales, right? This bottom of the funnel. And what was interesting is when we looked at the data, there's just diminishing in effectiveness, right? Like CAC is going up, um, AE productivity is going down. Um, I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And we're like reinventing tools to kind of like save that, but it's just like people aren't talking to sales as early in the process anymore, right? And then on the other part, like basically CPCs are going up, like it's getting less and less effective. Um, there's, you know, iOS 14, there's all these other things that are causing this problem. And when we kind of looked at this, the question was, huh, what if we just made that bigger? Like, what if we went after these customers in a way or these prospects in a way that like, instead of like forcing this river and trying to move people as quickly as humanly possible, like what if we just made that bigger, right? And the first strategy that we started playing with with this was freemium. So we basically said, okay, we're going to have traditional inbound. We had like eBooks and stuff like that. But then freemium creates this pool, right? Like people are using a product. What better content do you have than your actual physical product, right? It's the best content you're ever going to have. So if they're using that product. I own the lead to nurture them over time, right? And then we were like, okay, what's what's the non-product version of that? What's the quicker thing that has a better, like a quicker feedback cycle that we have? And I, I get what some of you might be thinking, right? Like, yeah, we publish eBooks, like we're good, right? We do traditional inbound, that's amazing. We have the most amazing SEO and that, that's awesome, right? The problem is, is that this is how traditional inbound works, right? This is the marketing wheel. I think maybe Jay Akunzo came up with this first time. Maybe it was an old HubSpot thing. I'm not sure. I didn't come up with this is basically what I'm trying to say. But you have this, this, this audience, right? And you're sending out blog posts, you're doing paid, you're doing social email, all these other things. And you're driving someone to an offer, some sort of ebook, right? And that's the point of traditional inbound. A lot of people don't realize the only point of traditional inbound is to get someone from there to there, right? It's only provide signal. Hey, they like download an ebook. Oh, they looked at this blog post. Now their lead score goes up. Now they go to a BDR, right? It's just, a, it's just supposed to be an off ramp. And I think the issue is, is that because it's so much more about timing today than it used to be. When you follow this traditional inbound path, what ends up happening is you're basically taking that user and you're basically like, oh, you're not ready? Well, I'm not ready either. Bye. And then you have to go spend money to get them back because you're not nurturing them in a particular way. And so when you focus on audience, not lead volume here, and you can still measure it, all this stuff, all kinds of different ways, you end up creating a pool. And you have another pool where all of a sudden like people are interacting with you on a regular basis and those people are interacting with your regular basis. They're not necessarily ready right away, but the first time they think about, oh, we finally need to go fix pricing or we are thinking about churn or something, they go, oh yeah, I, I think Profitable does something with that. Or I've seen their ads in their content. They do something with that. Let's get on the phone with them. And they've already learned so much from you because you have a relationship with them rather than just like they downloaded the ebook, they liked it, but you haven't talked to them in two years, right? Like I'm creating a pool, right? And to kind of look at this different visually, when you're using like a traditional inbound strategy, you launch an offer, it's very, very spiky. So I spike this up, this person basically goes off, right? With a media strategy, what you're doing with different shows, um, and this is what it looks like, you know, when you have users, like you publish a blog post on Tuesday, two people like look at it, um, and that might be your entire week, right? Because not everyone's going to open it. Not everyone's going to look at it because people have kids and time and all this other stuff, right? And then maybe you publish that another thing on Thursday, more people look at it, but again, like not everyone's looking for it. 
But with inbound media, what you're doing is you basically have multiple shows and you're building that audience over time. And I think it's really, really powerful because when you have multiple shows, when you kind of take this from, you know, not just one podcast, but multiple different podcasts that have done in the right way, you have your power user. And this is someone who watches every single thing that you put out. You have that one, you know, audience member who only looks at the one thing you publish every single week, but they're coming back every week. And then you have some sort of different variation. But what's really, really powerful about this is all of a sudden I continue to have this person come. I continue to have them, you know, basically understand things. Now, I get it. Oh my God, that's so expensive. Seven different shows, Patrick, you got to be insane. Well, keep in mind, we're, we're a bootstrap company. We still did this, right? I think one of the biggest things that like unlocked this were, was two pieces of data. The first piece of data is that a decent ebook, like one that isn't just a blog post in PDF form. Um, and we wrote some chunky ebooks. We wrote like definitely like, you know, one, our, our pricing books, like 130 pages, like it doesn't have to be that long, but still a decent ebook costs about $10,000. The cost of a season of a show, 13 episodes, one per week for a quarter, costs about under $10,000. Pricing page teardown, right now it costs maybe $100 per episode. It's super cheap because all of a sudden we're doing a bunch of different things to bring that cost down over time, right? But it's not something that's so, so crazy. And then the other piece of data was we looked at like what was kind of the max average um, that you could expect out of, you know, some sort of, you know, inbound strategy, right? The max average you could expect in terms of touch points was like 1.4 per week. We looked at media companies, like people like the Skim, Bloomberg, et cetera. They were getting like 5.8 touches per week, like just insane. That's their business, right? And, you know, this whole presentation could be boy, probably boiled down to the best folks at driving traffic and audience in the world are media companies. They're the worst at monetizing it. Tech companies are probably the best at monetizing it. So you want to kind of combine those two. But we basically were like, well, if we double the, 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 the average, all of a sudden, like brand takes off, right? And all of a sudden, brand becomes a huge thing. And we have this pool of customers to go after, or prospects to go after for our paid products. So how do you start, right? I wanted to kind of lay the foundation. In an hour-long talk, I could give you a bunch of how-tos and maybe in the Q&A, we can do that. But I think that the, the first thing to start with especially because you got to have to sell this to your team and probably your, your exec team, depending on your size is I would just start a podcast that interviews customers and target customers, like make it a 20 minute thing, have some like regular questions you're going to have. It doesn't have to be insanely high production value, but those target prospective customers, it's my favorite thing to do. You're like, Oh yeah, yeah cool. Yeah. And then like you stop recording and like, Oh, is there anything I can to help you? Oh yeah. It's interesting. You know, I know you guys do something with this. Can, can, can I talk to someone? Yeah, great. All of a sudden you have like sales, like sales pipeline, right? It's very direct. Right. But then you also have this piece of content that you're able to use for something. Now the other path, um, if you're a little more video inclined or, you know, you want to go there um, is really around turning. This is the first thing we did. We started turning each blog post into a video and it was, it was magical. Like just to give you context, we wrote like really good blog posts, like very high quality blog posts about how to do X or Y with pricing and churn and retention. And what we found was, is that we would, I'd go to a conference speaking and I would say, hey, like who here has heard of ProfitWell or Price Intelligently, our former brand? Um, and you'd get like 10% of people to raise, raise their hands. We changed nothing about the content, except I did a video where I would just get in front of a camera and just like do riff on like, hey, this is the overview of the video. All of a sudden you go to conferences after like a quarter of doing that and like 80% of us had heard of it or had heard of us, right? And the reason is because again, it's just a different medium, right? A couple of really common like objections. Um, if you don't have a really charismatic person, that's okay. Use more scripted, you know, type content. We, you know, when I was trying to get out of the front of the camera, I would do all the scripting for a series or a show. And then we would go through and have, you know, people basically, you know, with teleprompters, like do those scripts. Um, and then eventually I didn't even have to write the scripts because it was so formatted, right? There's a lot of different ways around this. Um, sometimes execs think they're more charismatic than they actually are. That's okay. But for some of you, like, it's one of those things where if we get, you know, a thousand people to listen right between their ears every single week to, you know, you talking about this problem or interviewing someone talking about this problem, it's a huge win. And, and this is the last objection I think is really important. Like, Everyone thinks they're trying to be like Mr. Beast. Um, it's a famous YouTuber. I, I had to clarify that because I, I, I LinkedIn message like who's the Mr. Beast of like software or whatever. Um, and people were like, who's Mr. Beast? Which I was shocked by. I was shocked that people didn't know that, but that's kind of the, you know, being in this world, I guess. Um, but the thing is, it's like, it's not about going viral. I think this is a huge mistake um, because viral in your space is super different. And this is why I, I recommend like when you go to an exec team talking about this, I always recommend like, hey, 
Um, what if we had a webinar every week that 500 to 1,000 people were, were tuning in and they came back every single week to listen to us talk about whatever we do or the problem that we have? That would be an enormous win. You'd be the greatest marketer of all time, right? And that's the point, right? That's what you're doing with this content. So think about it like an episodic webinar um, rather than something that like you're trying to get a million views because a million views in your space is like probably not the right amount of people. Like probably just, you know, some of your spaces have only a million people. Um, I'm running short on time. I had this other thing on alignment and, you know, chaos and here's some cool graphs uh, or <laughs> visuals. I think the biggest thing I wanted to kind of make a point here, um, I'll just go to this slide, is that alignment is really important in marketing. And what I've found with a lot of marketing leaders is they don't necessarily have like, what is, the, they don't have the mission of the company because the company hasn't put that in place like they should, but they also aren't like focused on what is the mission of like your marketing strategy and your team. So for us, we had this like defined mission up top, these guiding principles of do it for you and be the most helpful brand in SaaS. And as a marketing team, it was like, okay, how are we going to win there, right? And we evaluated, as you kind of saw, like, what is the winning strategy? And for us, it was very like, okay, this media strategy, because we only have 150,000 target customers in our space. That means we're not going to be winning based on like a quick sales cycle. They need to know who we are. We need to build up that pool, all those other things that I just talked about. And then what was really important was also this how much section, which is basically like, what is the tempo of what we're going to do as a company or as a team, a marketing team? And that was really important because that aligned then, you know, as, as people started taking these things over, it aligned with me on like, what can I expect out of this team? And sometimes that is a lower expectation than you, you would like, um, depending on who it is, but you at least having that conversation rather than, you know, getting into the situation that a lot of marketing leaders do, which is, oh crap, um, things are going poorly, sales has an excuse, product has an excuse. Those are more nebulous excuses, but I can point out that, you know, you didn't hit your like lead or opportunity volume number, even though it was impossible for you to hit. Like it just, it, it, it becomes really murky. And so I think when you have this like alignment and you have an actual doc, that's like, this is how we're going to win as a marketing team. And it's very well like executed. It's not fluffy. Um, and the tempo is, is, is very clear. Um, that helps a lot of marketers um, in alignment you know, is how high-performing functions really become a high-performing team. Um, it allows you to kind of hold the rest of your company and the functions accountable as well, because you look like you have your stuff together and they probably don't. Um, so hopefully everyone got some value. Um, I know we didn't get deep into like how to structure shows and stuff, but there's just a lot of content on that out there. Um, and I have a lot of opinions on that as well. We could go through the Q&A, but it was really important to me that like we laid the foundation of why this is so important so you can kind of sell it to your teams as well. Um, I'll end on like, this stuff's hard. It's chaotic. Um, your job, in my opinion, is cuddle with the chaos. Um, it's super, super important, whether you're bootstrap, venture backed, whether you have a marketing team of, you know, a hundred people, whether you have a marketing team of just you, um, there's a lot of chaos. You have a lot of surface area with marketing. And this is where like that alignment is so, so important, but also like picking that strategy and then just ruthlessly executing on it. Um, and that's what we did. Everything was like content. And then we use that to support every other strategy um, or those strat or those different pieces supported that strategy, which I think is super, super important. If you have any questions, want to contact me, yell at me, tell me I'm wrong um, or tell me I'm right. That's great too. I like positive reinforcement as well. Um, I'm Paticus on Twitter, patrickatproffle.com. I don't check my LinkedIn messages, but uh, yeah, hopefully we can get this Q&A to work, but appreciate y'all. Bye now.